Lesson 19, Review. Welcome back to Lenny's Latin class. Today we're on page 56, at the bottom of the page. And this is a review lesson, so we will be briefly reviewing some uh, concepts that we've already covered, and then doing a selected number of translation exercises. Okay, let's start with section 169, and let's review these items that they've listed here. Item number one says, inflect the model words in lessons 14 through 18. Okay, you can do that on your own. Number two, how is the imperfect tense formed? Okay, we've covered this in depth already, but I'll simply review it with you by saying that we add in the letters B and A before the personal ending. So for our first declension sample verb, laudo, you would get laudabam as the first person singular imperfect tense form, and that would be I was praising. Number three, how does the future of the first and second conjugations differ from the future of the third and fourth? Okay, that's a good question. The method for making future tense forms is different in the first and second conjugations than it is in the third and fourth. In the first two conjugations, we add the letters B and I before the personal ending. So we get the uh, bo bis bit, bimus bitis bunt endings. So for laudo, we would get laudabo as the first person singular future tense form. And that means I will praise. Lauda bis, you will praise. Lauda bit, he, she, or it will praise. So that's the bo bis bit way to do it. In the third and fourth conjugations, you don't do it that way. In the third and fourth conjugations, you get the letter E as the tense indicator for the future tense. So the answer to the question is, for the first two conjugations, you get the letters B and I. For the third and fourth conjugations, you get the letter E. Number four, what nouns have I-U-M in the genitive plural? The answer to that question is I-stem nouns of the third declension, or third declension I-stems. Okay, third declension I-stems are a special class of third declension nouns which actually have the letter I in the stem. Okay, for a third declension I stem, the last letter of the stem is the letter I. So in the genitive plural, you'll add U-M as your ending, and the letter I is already there from the stem, so you end up with I-U-M. In other cases, you'll get a contraction of vowels. For example, uh, the dative singular ending is the letter I, and there's already a letter I at the end of the stem, so those two I's contract down into one I. So the answer here to number four is third declension I stems. Turn the page to page 57, and let's look at number five. What is the difference between a predicate noun and a noun in apposition? Okay, generally we use the term predicate to describe a noun that comes after a verb of being. For example, if I say, Fred is a mailman. In that sentence, the word Fred is the subject, the word is is a verb of being, and the word mailman is a predicate. Okay, the word mailman there is not a direct object because the verb is a verb of being. A verb of being cannot generate a direct object you would have to have an action verb to generate a direct object, like Fred saw the mailman. Now the verb is an action verb, and the word mailman really is the direct object. But with a verb of being or existing, sometimes what is called a linking verb, you don't have a direct object because there's no action being performed on the word mailman. It's simply saying Fred is a mailman, so when you have a sentence that says, this is that, then the second noun is what we call a predicate. When we talk about apposition, the sentence structure is a bit different. If I were to make a sentence like this, 
Fred, comma, the mailman, comma, tripped over the hose. Okay, in that sentence, the word mailman is standing in apposition with the word Fred. Okay, there's no verb there saying that Fred is a mailman. It's just another noun sitting there describing the, uh, the word Fred. So in my mind, the answer to number five is that the difference between a predicate noun and a noun in apposition is that a predicate usually has a verb involved. You're saying this is that, but a noun in apposition is just sitting there adjacent to the noun, telling us more about it. Okay, let's move on to section 170. I'm going to let you review this vocabulary on your own. And moving on to section 171, these sentences are taken exactly from previous lessons, so I don't want to go over them again. However, on the following page, page 58, we have some exercises called sight reading. That's uh, section 172. And these are fresh sentences that we haven't seen before. So let's go ahead and turn the recording off and do section 172 on your own. And when you're finished, turn the recording back on and we'll go over them together. Okay, hopefully by now you've finished your translation exercises for section 172. Let's go over them together, starting with number one. Number one says, Unam partem galiae aquatani incolunt. Okay, the verb here is incolunt. That's a form of the verb incolo, which means to inhabit. This is third person plural, present tense. So it means they inhabit. And the subject here is aquatani. That's a Gallic tribe. So the aquatani inhabit. And then our direct object is partem. They inhabit a part. Notice the accusative singular ending there. It's being modified by unam. So unam partem says one part. And galiai is genitive, so it's of gal. So number one says the aquatani inhabit one part of gal. Number two is next. Una pars contenetur garumna flumine. Okeano finibus belgarum. Okay, the subject here is una pars, that means one part. The verb is contenetur, that's a form of the verb contineo, which means to bound or restrain or hold in or keep in. Now, this particular verb is a classic example of why you need to know what conjugation a verb is from. Okay, look at the letter that comes right before the personal ending. We have a personal ending, which is T-U-R. That's a third-person singular passive ending, right? So we know that this verb has to do with uh, he, she, or it being bounded, he, she, or it being restrained, he, she, or it being kept in check. But is it present or future? We learned that in the third and fourth conjugations, that letter E there would be a future tense indicator. But in the second conjugation, that's not future tense. That's just the regular way to express the present tense. So is continetur present or future? Well, to figure out the answer, we have to know what conjugation it's from. Let's think about it a minute. Contineo, continere, right? The infinitive form is continere. That has a long E there. That tells us that it's second conjugation. Okay, it's not contineo, continere. That would make it third conjugation because we'd have a short E there. No, instead it's contineo, continere. So now that we know it's second conjugation, we know that this particular verb form is present tense. It's not future. So why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this to encourage you to, uh, whenever you learn a new Latin verb, always learn all four principal parts and take note of what conjugation the verb is in because that's going to help you translate. It's going to help you understand what uh, tense you are working with. Okay, so continator says he, she, or it is bounded. So our subject and verb together say, 
one part is bounded. And now we have lots of ablatives of means. Garumna flumine means by means of the Garonne River. Okeano means by means of the ocean. Finibus belgarum means by means of the borders of the Belgians. And if we want to, we can translate finibus in a singular way and just say territory. So number two says, one part is bounded by the Garonne River, by the ocean, by the territory of the Belgians. Number three is next. Belgae pertinent ad inferiorem partem fluminis reini. Okay, the subject here is Belgae. That means Belgians, the folks who live in what is today Belgium. And pertinent is a form of the verb pertineo, which means to extend. This is third person plural present tense. So what we have so far says the Belgians extend. Now we have a prepositional phrase, ad inferiorem partem. That means to the lower part. Okay, partem means part. And as you can tell from the footnote, inferiorem means lower. So the Belgians extend to the lower part. And then fluminous rainy is genitive. That's possessing partem. Fluminous is the genitive singular form of the third declension noun flumen, which means river. And rainy is also genitive. That means the Rhine River. So number three says, the Belgians extend to the lower part of the Rhine River. Number four is next. Aquitania agarumna flumine ad Pyrenaeos montes et ad eam partem okeani quae est ad hispaniam pertinet. Okay, our subject here is Aquitania. That's a section of Gaul. It's the part that's in the lower left-hand corner of Gaul. And on the Study Helps page, I've provided you with several maps that you can use to examine the geography of Gaul. If you look over toward the left, you will see Aquitania. Later, that section becomes known as Aquitaine. And the verb here is all the way at the end of the sentence, pertinet. And as you know already, that means extend. So the subject and verb together say, Aquitania extends. Now we have lots of prepositional phrases that will tell us uh, where it extends from and where it extends to. So agarumna flumine means from the Garonne River. Okay, a is a preposition that takes the ablative. Garumna and flumine are both ablative singular. And then ad Pyrenaeos montes, that means to the Pyrenees mountains. So what we have so far would say Aquitania extends from the Garonne River to the Pyrenees mountains. Now we have the word et, which means and. It's going to tell us even more about the geography here. Ad eam partem. That's a prepositional phrase. Ad means to, partem means part. And the word eam here is a form of a demonstrative that we have not yet covered. This is a special demonstrative that we will cover in future lessons. For now, just translate it as the word that. So ad eam partem, translated as to that part. Okeani is genitive singular, so to that part of the ocean. Now we have a relative clause, quae est ad hispaniam. Okay, you have some experience now working with relative pronouns and relative clauses. We haven't studied them formally, but you've seen enough of them now that you probably get the idea. Translate quai as which. Notice that quai is a feminine form of the relative pronoun because partem is a feminine noun of the third declension. Partem is the antecedent which the relative pronoun quai is referring back to. So when you have a relative pronoun referring back to an antecedent like that, it has to have the same gender. So partem is feminine, quai is feminine. Okay, so translate quai as which, and then est ad hispaniam. We'll translate ad here as near. Okay, remember that ad oftentimes 
means to or toward, but it can also mean other things like against, near, or at. So, qui est ad hispaniam means uh, which is near Spain. Okay, Hispania was the Roman name for Spain. So, our basic structure here is Aquitania pertinet. Aquitania extends, and then we have lots of prepositional phrases telling us uh, where it extends to. So, number four, altogether, we'll say something like this. Aquitania extends from the Garumna River to the Pyrenees Mountains and to that part of the ocean which is near Spain. Number five is next. Domnorix helwetiis erit amicus, quod ex eaquitate or get a filiam in matrimonium ducat. Okay, we have lots to talk about here. We have uh, actually two clauses here connected by the conjunction quod, which means because. So the structure of the sentence will be uh, such and such because such and such. Okay, the first part of the sentence says, Dumnorix helwetiis erit amicus. The subject here is Dumnorix, and the verb is erit. Erit is future tense. It means he, she, or it will be. So the subject and verb together say, Dumnorix will be. And we have a predicate here, amicus, which means friend. So Dumnorix will be a friend. And then we have uh, helwetiis here, that's dative plural, and that's the party in the sentence that is benefiting or receiving. Okay, remember that I've often told you that the dative case shows the party that's benefiting or receiving. So the idea here is Dumnerix will be a friend to the Helwetii. Okay, so Helwetiis is dative plural. Now we have the word quod, which means because. So this is going to tell us why Dumnerix will be a friend to the Helwetii. By the way, the word amicus means friend. It can also be an adjective that means friendly. It can be Amicus, amica, amicum, a first and second declension adjective that means friendly. So what this could say is Dominorix will be friendly toward the Helwetii. In fact, I actually like that translation better. It doesn't really matter. They're saying largely the same thing. I'm just letting you know that it could read that way. Okay, so we have the word quod. Now we have a brand new clause. And the verb in this new clause is the word duket. That's a form of the verb duco, which means lead. Notice the letter E coming right before the personal ending. That could tell us that this is a second conjugation present tense, or it could be third or fourth conjugation future. Let's think for a moment, what conjugation is the verb duco from? Let's think of the four principal parts, duco, ducere, Duxi ductum. Okay, by looking at the infinitive form, that is the second of the four principal parts, we see that it's ducere with a short e near the end. The third letter from the end is a short e. If it were ducere, that would be second conjugation because it would have a long e there. But it's not ducere, it's ducere. The e, three letters from the end, is short, so the accent recedes one syllable to the left, and you get ducere. Okay, so duco, ducere, duxi, ductum is a third conjugation verb. So when you see this letter E here before the personal ending in a third conjugation verb, that indicates future tense. So duket says, he, she, or it will lead. There is no separate noun here to be the subject of this particular clause. So we need to use the pronoun included in duket. It's simply referring back to Dumnerix again. Dumnerix is the one doing the leading here. So we'll translate it as he will lead. And the direct object here is filiam. That means daughter, and it's accusative singular. So here's what we have so far. Dumnerix will be friendly 
toward the Helvetii because he will lead the daughter. We have the word orgetorigus here, which is the genitive singular form of orgetorix. Oftentimes, when you see a genitive possessing a noun, it comes right after the noun it possesses. In this particular case, we have orgetorigus coming before the noun it possesses. So, philium is being possessed by orgetorigus. It's the daughter of orgetorix. Okay? So, what we have so far says, Dumnorix will be friendly toward the Helvetii because he will lead the daughter of Orgetorix. The word matrimonium means marriage. So, in matrimonium, uh, that's in taking the accusative. So, we have into marriage. So, the way it reads is, he will lead the daughter of Orgetorix into marriage. And really, this is an idiom. Uh, to lead in marriage, or to lead into marriage, is an idiom in Latin that means to marry someone, okay? So we can say, instead of, he will lead into marriage, we can just say, he will marry. So the idea here is that Dumnorix is going to marry the daughter of Orgetorix and establish friendly relations between their two countries, Okay. Dumnorix is from one tribe, Orgetorix is from another tribe, the Helvetii. But by arranging this marriage, they're going to achieve friendly diplomatic relations between them. That's why it says Dumnorix will be friendly toward the Helvetii. Okay? So Dumnorix will be friendly toward the Helvetii because he will lead into marriage the daughter of Orgetorix, or he will marry the daughter of Orgetorix. Now we have ex ea kiwatate. That's a prepositional phrase that means from that state. Okay, the word ea here is that uh, demonstrative that we saw before that we haven't really covered yet. And this particular demonstrative can mean a variety of things. It can mean this, it can mean that. It can actually mean he, she, or it. It can mean, in some instances, I think it's best to translate it just as the. But anyway, uh, for now, just translate ea as that. So ex ea kiwatate will say from that state. But that's referring to the Helvetii. So number five says, Dumnorix will be friendly toward the Helvetii because from that state, he will marry the daughter of Orgetorix. Number six is next. Is pagus apelabator tigurinus. Okay, the word is here is that same demonstrative I've been talking about, which we have not yet covered. Just translate it as uh, that or this. What does the footnote say? The footnote says, translate it as this. And a pagus is a district or a canton. The state or the tribe of the Helvetii was divided into four parts, four districts, and apparently they each had names. So, Ispagus says this district, and then Apelabatur is a form of the verb apello, which means to call something something or to name something, and it's imperfect tense, third person singular, passive. So the idea here is he, she, or it was named or he, she, or it was called and then Tigurinus is the name. So number six says uh, this district was called Tigurinus. Number seven is next. Kiwitas Helvetia in quatuor pagos divisa est. Okay, Kiwitas means state or tribe and it's talking about Helvetia, so it's saying the tribe, Helvetia, or the state, Helvetia, I guess you could say Helvetia is standing in apposition with Kiwitas. So the state, Helvetia, divisa est. Okay, that means it is divided. And then in quatuor pagos means into four districts or into four cantons. Okay, in here is taking the accusative, 
So we can translate it as into. Quatuor means for. The word quatuor is not declinable. You don't change the endings depending on what case it is. Only the numbers one, two, and three have uh, declensional endings. Once you get to four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, those numbers are just what you call indeclinables. So quatuor is indeclinable. It never changes form. Even though it agrees with pagos, it's modifying pagos. You can see that pagos has the accusative plural ending of the second declension. But quatuor does not, again, because it's indeclinable. So in quatuor pagos says into four districts. So number seven says the state, Helvetia, is divided into four districts. Number eight is next. Alobroges qui transrodanum vicos habebant ad caesarem viniunt. The structure of this sentence is that we have a main clause with a long relative clause embedded in the middle. So the main clause is allobroges ad caesarem viniunt. And then the relative clause is qui transrodanum vicos habebant. So let's do the main clause first. Alobroges ad caesarem viniunt. Okay, the verb here is viniunt. That's a form of the verb winio, which means come. Winniunt is present tense, third person plural. So it's uh, they are coming. And the they is the alobroges. That's a Gallic tribe. So the alobroges are coming. Ad caesarem is to Caesar. Uh, Julius Caesar's name is from the third declension, Caesar, Caesaris. So ad Caesarem is to Caesar. So the allobroges are coming to Caesar. Now we have a relative clause that's going to tell us more about the allobroges. And like any good relative clause, this one starts with a relative pronoun. Okay, qui is a relative pronoun. The antecedent here is the word allobroges. Whenever you have a relative pronoun, it has to have an antecedent. That is some kind of noun that it refers back to. So we'll translate qui as who. Again, notice that the relative clause has to have the same gender as its antecedent. So qui here is a nominative plural masculine relative clause because it needs to agree with allobroges. Okay, habebant is the verb of the relative clause. That's a form of the verb habeo, which means to have. It's imperfect tense, third person plural. So they were having is what it means. And wikos means villages. That's accusative plural. So the sentence is starting to form up like this. The alobroges who had villages are coming to Caesar. Okay, one more thing to translate, that's transrodanum. That means across the Rhone River. So number eight as a whole reads like this. The Allobroges, who had villages across the Rhone, are coming to Caesar. Number nine is next. Legione, quam habet, atque militibus, qui ex provincia convenient, Agenawa ad montem iuram, qui fine sequinorum ab helvetiis dividit, caesar murum et fossam perducet. Okay, this is a very long sentence, but it's really not as difficult as it looks. Most of it really is just a bunch of prepositional phrases. The main clause uh, that we're interested in here is the very last part where it says uh, caesar murum et falsam per ducat. Okay, that's the main clause here. Besides that, we have a relative clause and some prepositional phrases. So let's start with the last part. Caesar murum et falsam per ducat. The verb here, per ducat, is a compound verb. It's really the verb duco, which means lead, with a prepositional prefix, uh, per. Per means through. So per duco together means to lead through 
And what this verb really is saying is it's uh, talking about extending something. It's lead through in the sense of extend, as we will see in a moment. Uh, so per ducat is from the third conjugation. So the letter E here indicates future tense. So per ducat says he, she, or it will extend. Okay, so the subject here is Caesar. That's Julius Caesar. So the main subject and verb here say, Caesar will extend. And what will he extend? Murum et falsam. Okay, murum means wall. That's a form of the noun murus from the second declension that means wall. And falsam is the first declension noun falsa, which means ditch. They're both accusative singular, the direct objects of per ducat. So this last part of the sentence says, Caesar will extend uh, a wall and a ditch. Okay, and how will he do it? Well, go back to the very first word of the sentence, legione. That's the third declension noun, legio, which means legion. And here it's in the ablative case. It's an ablative of means. So by means of the legion, Caesar will extend the wall and the ditch. And what it's saying here is he's going to make them do all the work. The, the soldiers are going to have to get out there and, and dig the trench or the ditch. And the dirt that they dig up when they're making the ditch or the trench, they're going to put that next to the trench to make a wall right next to it. So this is what you call uh, making fortifications or earthworks. Okay, so Julius Caesar is going to make his troops get out there and dig a huge fortification in which they take dirt out of a ditch and put it next to it, building up an embankment. So it's a ditch and a wall right next to each other, all made out of earth. So what we have so far is Caesar will extend a wall and a ditch by means of the legion. Quam habet is a relative clause. Quam is a relative pronoun. Translate quam as which. And habet is a uh, he has. So quam habet says which he has. Okay, so moving on, we have atque. Atque means and. And as we read previously, atque emphasizes the part that comes after it. Like in English when we say and not only that, but also blah, 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 like we're trying to draw attention to it. We have another ablative of means here, militibus. That's from the third declension noun, miles, which means soldier. Here it's ablative plural. So it means by means of soldiers. So Caesar will extend a wall and a ditch by means of the legion, which he has, and by means of soldiers, okay? Qui ex provincia convenient, that's yet another relative clause, starting with a relative pronoun, qui. We'll translate qui as which. Convenient is the verb here. It's from the verb convenio. Winio is a fourth conjugation verb that means come, and it's a compound verb. It's got the prepositional prefix con, which in this case means together. So convenio means to come together. Notice the vowel E here before the personal ending. That indicates future tense. So convenient says they will come together. Ex provincia means out of the province. Okay, moving on, we have uh, agenawa. That means from Geneva. Ad montem juram, yet another prepositional phrase that means to Mount Jura. Now we have yet another uh, relative clause which tells us more information about Mount Jura. Okay, the word qui here is a relative pronoun starting a relative clause. So qui fines sequanorum ab helvetiis dividit. It says... It divides the territory of the Sequani from the Helwetii. If you look at a map, you'll see that the 
what they call Mount Jura, is to the west. It's on the west side of Helvetia, or what is today Switzerland, forming the western natural border there. And on the other side of that mountain range was the tribe known as the Sequani. So dividit means it divides, it's present tense, and it divides the Fines Sequanorum, the territory of the Sequani, ab Helvetiis, from the Helvetii. So let's put it all together, and I'll try to take it relatively in order of the words given here, but I might have to move a couple of words around. So here's what it says. By means of the legion which he has, and by means of the soldiers who will come together out of the province, Caesar will extend a wall and a ditch from Geneva to Mount Jura, which divides the territory of the Sequani from the Helvetii. Okay, number 10 is next. Trace copiarum partes Helvetii transflumen ducebant. Okay, the verb here is ducebant. That's a form of the verb duco, which means lead. It's imperfect tense, third person plural. So it means they were leading. And the subject here is Helvetii. So the Helvetii were leading. And then we have trace and partes. Trace, partes means three parts. And it's being possessed by copiarum. That means of the troops. Okay, the word copia can mean things like a, a supply or an abundance. But it can also mean troops. According to the dictionary, when it's plural, that's when it means troops or forces. So tres copiarum partes says three parts of the troops. Notice that the genitive that's possessing partes is wedged between the adjective and the noun. Sort of a genitive sandwich, I guess you could call that. Very characteristic of Julius Caesar's writing style. Transflumen means across the river. Flumen is a neuter noun of the third declension. So not only is the word flumen nominative, it's also accusative. Because for any neuter noun, the nominative forms and accusative forms are the same. So number 10 as a whole says, The Helvetii were leading three parts of the troops across the river. Okay, that does it for this lesson. Don't forget to do your oral practice where you make up sentences and say them. It's very important. Try to do it a little bit each day, and your progress will be swift. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next lesson.